And welcome back. Let's get you caught up. In the race for U.S. Senate, Bernie Sanders has been declared the winner. Here are the latest numbers. Right now, he's at 65 percent. Lawrence Zupan at 30 percent. Sanders gave a victory speech just a short time ago. Let's take a listen. Our job is to tell this president that we will not tolerate policies which are racist and sexist and homophobic, that all over this country, the American people, led by the state of Vermont, are going to stand up and fight back. In the U.S. House race, Peter Welch also declared the winner. Right now, here are the numbers. Welch has 66% over Anya Tinio at 28%. All right, let's take a look at the race for governor. Incumbent Phil Scott is ahead 58% over Democratic challenger Christine Hallquist at 37%. Again, still a lot to go. 88 of 275 precincts reported. And a look at the lieutenant governor race. The incumbent David Zuckerman is ahead by 55% over the Republican challenger Don Turner at 43%. In the Vermont attorney general's race, incumbent Democrat T.J. Donovan has 67% over his Republican challenger Jansen Wilhoyt at 29%. Now to the Secretary of State. In that race, incumbent Democrat Jim Condos has 63% compared to Brooke Page's 33%, the Republican in the race. All right, let's look at Vermont Treasurer. The incumbent, Democratic incumbent Beth Pierce is ahead 65% over the Republican challenger Richard Morton at 35%. And in the auditor of accounts race, incumbent Doug Hoffer, 58%. His Republican challenger, Richard Kenyon, at 37%. Again, 88 out of 275 precincts reporting. Well, now let's take a look at turnout. There are always questions about whether voters will turn out for midterm elections. Especially when there are no open seats or hotly contested races on the Vermont ballot. Look at these numbers. You can see in the last five presidential elections, Vermont's turnout has averaged 69%, while in midterms, the average drops to 54%. The last midterm election in 2014, turnout dropped to 45%. That was the lowest turnout in at least the last 40 years. Secretary of State Jim Condos keeps track of voter turnout, and he is with our Cat Zoni tonight at the Democratic Election Headquarters in South Burlington. Cat. Well, actually, we've heard from several people who went to their polling places today that turnout was either steady or high. What is your office hearing about turnout? Well, we, anecdotally, we've heard that it's high around the state and in, in specific locations, it's been even higher. So uh, it's approached in some cases uh, presidential year, but we'll see. I mean, I can tell you that uh, our uh, early vote numbers uh, in 2014, the last midterm, were 33,400. This year, we've already approached 69,000. So we've more than doubled what it was in 2014 midterms. So why do you think we have had a higher turnout than usual midterm uh, election years? I think there's a lot of reasons for it. And, and I think a lot of the reasons happen to be there are a lot of local races that were uh, important to folks. There were also local ballot questions. Uh, and, and frankly, what's going on at the national level? Really quickly here, any issues pop up today? Not that I'm aware of. You know, it's the typical uh, a machine breaks down here or there, but we usually can get those back up and running real quickly. Uh, and of course, Vermont has voter marked paper ballots, so at the worst case, we can always hand count. All right, Secretary of State Jim Connors, thank, thank you so much. Back to you, Celine and Darren. Kat, thank you very much. Now to the balance of power in the Vermont House. Democrats haven't had a supermajority in this biennium. They need 100 seats. That would include allies, typically progressives. That matters in trying to override vetoes by the governor. Here are the results right now. Again, a lot of reporting left to do. 55 Dems, 31 Republicans. There are a couple of progressives in there as well. Again, 100 needed for that super majority. And here are the latest numbers from the Vermont Senate. There are 30 seats in that body right now. You can see that there are 22 Democrats, six Republicans, and two progressives.
Well, let's head to the Republican headquarters now. That is where Channel 3 political reporter Neil Goswami is tonight. What are you making of the balance of power? What are you hearing there? And have you heard anything um, about Kurt Wright, the Republican in Burlington? Hey, Darren and Celine. Well, it does appear that uh, Kurt Wright is losing tonight. Uh, the Democrats have been making a big push to have a veto-proof majority in the House, and they appear like they may be on their way. Along with uh, Kurt Wright, Fred Baser, a moderate Republican who sits on the House Ways and Means Committee, appears to be going down. Uh, in Stowe, Representative Heidi Sherman, a longtime incumbent, appears to have survived. She's up by about 86 votes over Democrat Marina Mirberg. And Democrats were hopeful they could pick off a seat there, but again, uh, Heidi Sherman looks like she will be returning to the state house in January, and uh, they'll we'll bring you more results as they come in. But it looks like Democrats are picking up seats tonight. Neil, talking about the governor's race, Governor Scott in the lead, but is there? Do you think there's still a chance for Christine Hallquist? Former Speaker of the House, Shop Smith. You know, it looks pretty tough at this point. The governor is, is pretty much winning all over the state, aside from uh, Wyndham County. Um, I was in the governor's war room a little while ago. Uh, he's in there with his team and his family, and they look pretty confident. They're, inten they're intensely watching the, uh, the returns come in, but they feel pretty good about this, and they should, uh, as it appears he is well on his way to victory tonight. All right, Neil Goswami, thank you so much. Republican strategist Denise Casey is here to talk a little bit about uh, this. What are you making of this shift in, and Democrats picking up some seats by the looks? Well, good evening. It's good to be here. Thank you. Um, it, it looks like uh, Vermonters have are deciding on divided government at this point. The governor, uh, Governor Scott, looks very, very strong statewide, uh, but it does look like the Democrats are going to pick up some seats in the legislature. When we talk about the governor's race, Christine Hallquist, you know, oh, making history by even just getting this far. Are you surprised that the race is as far, the, the margin is as wide as it is? Well, given that turnout is so high, it is a little surprising that she's not doing a little better. It is early, still a lot of precincts to report. Um, but again, you know, these races, uh, folks know Governor Scott. Uh, he's been campaigning hard. He's well known. Um, he was in the Senate for 14 years. Um, and uh, Christine Hallquist has struggled really to get out there and connect with voters. And you mentioned uh, the high voter turnout. Does that typically not play well for Republicans? Well, it doesn't. You know, in deep blue Vermont, um, this higher turnout would stand to reason would benefit uh, Democrats. And we are seeing that uh, down the ticket with some of these uh, House and Senate races. Now, it's not all bad news for Republicans. It looks like Casey Toof in Franklin County will take Cory Parent's seat. Cory Parent looks very strong for the Senate. Um, and things look okay for Republicans in Rutland. Again, it's early. Um, mm -hmm. It's not all bad news uh, for Republicans, but it does look like Democrats will pick up seats in the legislature. Now, I know you're a Republican strategist, but what do you think happened with Christine Hawkins? What went wrong in terms of why she's not resonating more with voters? Well, as you've talked about a lot tonight, it's difficult uh, to unseat a first-term governor. Governor Scott is incredibly popular. Um, name recognition is something she struggled with. Um, she struggled to raise money. I think a lot of folks, certainly I thought, uh, given um, the profile of her race, that she would raise more money. That, that did not happen. Um, and I think that that's really been a challenge for her, to get out, to get her name out there, and to connect with voters. Denise Casey, thank you so much. You. Nice to see you. Appreciate thank your time. You. Well, don't go anywhere. Channel 3 special coverage of election 2018 rolls on tonight. Next, updates on the races in New Hampshire. WCAX Channel 3 News election coverage brought to you by Vermont. Welcome back to the Channel 3 News coverage of election 2018. We are watching a real battle tonight for governor of New Hampshire. Yeah, here are mm -hmm. some big surprises here. Take a look. 50% to 48%. This one will be a nail biter tonight. Our recent poll said it and there it is. Chris Sununu, 50% Molly Kelly, 48%. Let's go right to Adam Sullivan in New Hampshire and Manchester. What are you making of this, Adam? 
cautiously optimistic. That's the word from Governor Chris Sununu. He has actually been here at the headquarters, uh, Sununu headquarters, Republican headquarters, for about an hour now. He's been mingling with the crowd, shaking hands, and thanking his staff and supporters. He told me that really this is a night, win or lose, to talk about the accomplishments that he has made over the past two terms. He points to full-day kindergarten. He points to investments in the mental health system, in the money for the opioid crisis. Um, and again, you know, Chris Sununu, really, this was his race to lose. He has been ahead in the polls uh, for the past month, double-digit leads, though the race has been tightening. A, a recent poll from the University of New Hampshire had this race neck and neck, and obviously that's playing out tonight, Darren. And Molly Kelly, really, you know, the Democrat, she has an uphill battle. She lacks the name recognition that Sununu has, and she also lacks, you know, fundraising capacity. Sununu has raised thousands. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for this campaign and that obviously plays a factor getting on television ads and getting your message out there uh, but right now again uh, the governor says he is optimistic about his uh, his prospects tonight but it, it is early so you know I think we're under half the precincts reporting so it, we could be in for a very long night here in New Hampshire Darren Celine Adam you know for our Sununu's camp you know with her she's a relative unknown why do they think think this race is as tight as it is? Well, Celine, I think it's that so-called blue wave. Molly Kelly has really sort of tr tied Sununu to the Trump campaign and to sort of the negativity that that is turning off a lot of voters, you know, negativity coming out of Washington. And Kelly has really made an effort to tie him to that tone. Um, but, but you know, the independent voters in New Hampshire really pride themselves on their politics. And it's not often that undeclared voters head into the polls and vote straight party ticket or protest their vote in that sort of way but obviously you know because of the mood in Washington that is trickling down here in New Hampshire but how much really that will be decided at the polls the Democrats are counting on big turnout that will help their candidate and also being able to sway those undeclared voters the largest voting group here in the Granite State. Celine Darren. Thank you very much. Well, in the Vermont governor's race, incumbent Phil Scott looking like he's headed to victory. Well, we visited the governor in his hotel room at the Doubletree Hotel just a short time ago. There you see him sitting with all of his folks, everybody who helps run Island. that campaign, and they are watching election coverage on Channel 3 in that room. They say they are hopeful for a victory. You can see the governor taking notes listening to what's going on, maybe doing a little math, who knows what's happening there. But again, the governor saying that he is optimistic that he is gonna take this tonight. We've been giving you the vote totals from Vermont's top races all night long, but is the support for the candidates uniform across the state? Let's take a look at the numbers broken down by county. We start with the governor's race. And right now, Christine Holquist is only picking up Wyndham County. The rest going to Phil Scott with 124 of 271 precincts reporting. In the lieutenant governor's race, a lot of green for David Zuckerman, the incumbent progressive Democrat. Right now, Don Turner, the Republican, taking the top tier of Vermont. We're talking about Essex, Orleans, Franklin and Grand Isle counties, as well as Rutland County, which is a Republican stronghold. Now in the U.S. Senate race, Bernie Sanders is running as an independent, represented in gold. And there's a lot of gold, but there's also um, a lot of weight on there, so I'm not sure what that was all about. And in the U.S. House race, Democrat Peter Welch in blue, he takes the whole state except for Essex County. All right, in the other statewide races, Attorney General T.J. Donovan is leading with 67% of the vote over his Republican challenger, Jansen Wilhoyt, at 29%. We're now at 122 of 275 precincts reporting. The Secretary of State, incumbent Jim Condo, 64% over his Republican challenger, H. Brooke Page, at 32%. Beth Pierce winning another term if she keeps this up at 65% over her challenger, Richard Morton, at 35%.
And right now it's Doug Hoffer over his Republican challenger, Richard Kenyon, 59% to 37%. Let's check in with the Democrats now at the Hilton in Burlington. Kat Villanzoni is with Terry Anderson of the Democratic Party. Kat. Absolutely. Well, Terry, you know, it's we've been watching. I mean, we're cranning looking at the screens right now. Um, how, what are people really paying attention to here tonight? I think it's attention's divided. There's a lot of people looking at the national races because there's a lot of investment in what's going on in Washington, D.C. But people are also really focused on a number of local Vermont races, certainly uh, the races for state legislature around the state. We're looking really good for Democrats right now. We're going to hold our own in the state Senate. Looks like we're going to pick up 10 or 12 seats in the House at least, and that's very significant. Waiting for some more numbers to come in on the statewide races. Looks like all of our statewide incumbents are going to be reelected. Uh, and so people are looking at all that stuff. What about the numbers for the governor's race? Obviously, that's a big ticket item. What's yeah. your thoughts so far? Uh, so far, I think I think it's a little weaker than than we wanted it to be. Uh, we're, we're waiting for some of the bigger Democratic towns to start reporting in, and I think it will tighten up some then. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to see as they come in where, where the final numbers stand. So obviously, you mentioned it earlier. There's you know some wish that we'll pick up more seats in the House. Um, if you get a super majority, will you continue to work with the governor? Well, I think the question is, will the governor work with the supermajority? You know, the, the House Democrats tried again and again to work with, with, with Governor Scott, and he always kept coming in with last-minute proposals and changing demands, you know, in the ninth hour. Um, House Democrats view themselves as being a co-equal branch of government, the legislature and the executive branch. It's important if Phil Scott's reelected that he treat it that way as well. We heard that turnout might be high for this election. What's your reaction to that? Is that a good thing for you? Is it not? Oh, high turnout is good for everybody. I mean, it's good for our democracy, and it is good for the Democratic Party as well. We know that when people turn out, Democrats do better. Uh, we worked really hard to get voters out to the polls to spread the message about how important it is to vote. Um, it sounds like nationally they're saying that right now it may be 100 million people voting nationally in a midterm, which is something we haven't had ever happen before. So that kind of enthusiasm we're seeing in Vermont as well, we're all for it. And which races are is the party for Vermont focused on the most tonight? I think right now we're focused on tracking the various legislative races. Um, you know, we're, we're, we had about 20 targets around the state. Some of them we don't have any numbers from at all. Uh, we're really excited about Bob Hooper winning, knocking off Kurt Wright here in Burlington. Lucy Rogers winning up in Cambridge. There's a number of races like that. Uh, we think Mitzi Johnson looks like she's in good shape up in the islands, but we're waiting for the last counts to report there. Um, so those kind of races. And some of them are going to take... All right, Kat, thank you very much. Let's head back to Galen Etlin at the Social Media Center. Galen, what are you seeing? Well, not actually a whole lot. I think the conversations kind of died down, at least about specific issues and candidates. It may also be because we haven't had official declarations on some of the candidates as those tallies still get um, counted up tonight. Uh, Terry thanking us for our coverage, you know, keeping her up to date on the results, and she's looking for Windsor County results. Uh, Terry, I think Darren just reread some of the county information from Vermont, so stay tuned. We'll continue to have updates on that throughout the night as well. Eric sends us a great question on. On Twitter. He says, where does the Associated Press get off reporting who is the winner when there is only a couple percent of votes counted? What right and authority do they have to make these claims and just let the numbers come in and let it play out? So this is something that a number of people have actually asked across our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. Um, so the AP did an exit poll with 1,000 Vermonters, and so it bases a lot of its projections based off of some of those polls that it makes. Now, we do know that polls are not always 100% correct, and the results could change as we go throughout the night, and that's what makes our live coverage I feel important in the sense that we will continue to update those numbers. We, as WCAX Channel 3 News, are not declaring uh, any endorsement for a candidate or saying that they are officially the winner. We are saying that the Associated Press has declared it and we're simply reporting the, 
excuse me, reporting that to you. So we will keep all of those numbers up to date throughout the entire night. And if it by chance candidates who have been declared the winner are no longer winning, we will be the first ones to tell you that. So stay tuned. Keep tweeting at me. Your questions are great. We may even discuss this a little bit more with some of our political analysts later tonight. Eric, thank you. And the rest of you as well. Again, that hashtag on Twitter, hashtag WCAX election. We also have a post pinned to our WCAX Facebook page where you can comment questions or uh, your own comments about some of the issues in this election. I'd be happy to read them. And I agree, Gail, and our live coverage yes. is so important. And you, everyone will much. get it here first. <laughs> and that's why you shouldn't go anywhere. We are expecting to hear more from the candidates, and we'll have more analysis on the way. Plus, your latest election 2018 results right here on Channel 3 in just a few. Well, a lot has been decided in election 2018, but there are still some big races to be decided. Especially in New York, where the polls only closed about 40 minutes ago. In the 21st District Congressional race covering northern New York, incumbent Elise Stefanik um, and challenger Tedra Cobb, we have no results yet from that race, so we're just going to have to be patient. Kelly O'Brien is standing by in Glens Fall with the very latest on that race. And God, it must be tense there right now, Kelly. Yeah, definitely. People are talking. They are watching these numbers come in live on these big screens. You can hear uh, there's actually some speakers here, too, talking all about the importance of having Elise being reelected and why they do not want to see a Democrat there. Um, so these numbers, as we said, we're watching them come in live as we can, learning more. And when we have those results, of course, we will bring them right here to you. Kelly O'Brien and Glens Falls, thank you. And here are some early numbers in other big New York races right now in the governor's race. Andrew Cuomo, 78% over Mark Molinaro, and I believe yep, he, he just has declared been winner. declared the winner in that race. Let's move on to the U.S. Senate race. Kirsten Gillibrand, 81% over Shel Farley, who has 19% right now with... 3,260 of about 16,000 reporting. Well, we've been telling you all night about the candidates at the top of each race, but there are plenty of third-party and independent candidates who ran in this election. In the race for U.S. Senate, there were nine people on the ballot. Bernie Sanders is at the top, followed by his closest Republican challenger, and then the rest of the ticket. A lot to choose from in that race. <laughs> against a very powerful incumbent. Still going, seeing that's how long it was. <laughs> so the U.S. House race, Peter Welch and Anya Tineo, the big two here, mm -hmm. but several others ran for Welch's seat, yeah. as you can see. Yeah, Chris Erickson, Laura Potter, um, to name two more that were on the bottom of the four. And now let's uh, get to the governor's race. Here are some of the folks who ran in that race. Of course, we've been talking about Phil Scott and Christine Hallquist all night, but uh, some other folks also ran for governor, and you see them right there. Some of those folks, perennial candidates. We mm -hmm. see them on the ballot just about every year. Common in, in Vermont, Vermont, isn't it? It is. And in the race for lieutenant governor, obviously we have the lead. We have the incumbent David Zuckerman and his Republican challenger Don Tur Turner. But again, that there were still three on this pa on this ballot. So, you know, it's. It keeps it exciting, doesn't it? It sure does. <laughs> it keeps it exciting. And let's Gives talk everybody about, a shot, Let's it? talk about election night excitement with Denise Casey, again, a Republican yeah. strategist for us this evening. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining yeah, us good again. Good evening. Um, so yeah. we were talking a little, yeah. a little bit about sort of um, division of power. Now, especially if the Democrats are picking up some more seats tonight, what is what do you mean exactly by that? And is this good, perhaps, for... Um, policy and politics in the state of Vermont. Well, I think it is. You know, um, Vermonters are notorious ticket splitters, and what that means is they may vote for a Democrat for one office and a Republican for another, an independent for one office, a progressive for another. Um, and so what we've seen tonight, and again, it's early, there's still lots of, of votes to be counted, uh, but what we've seen tonight is an overwhelming number of Vermonters um, 
uh, pick uh, Governor Phil Scott uh, to lead, to be our executive. Uh, and many of those voters then selected a Democrat uh, to represent them in the state Senate or, or uh, in the General Assembly in the House. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably pretty unlikely that those Vermonters took the time to go and vote today for gridlock, for, you know, uh, um, for conflict, right. um, for the kind of Washington-style challenges that we're seeing. Um, instead, they really expect these leaders to sort this out, to figure out a path forward. I think it's a clear endorsement for an affordability agenda of some kind, uh, but they expect progress. But doesn't that cause challenges, though? I mean, because you're, ha I mean, you're having representatives from both sides. I mean, we've seen this historically. That causes problems. That makes it harder to pass legislation to move things forward. Uh, it can. Uh, we did see six years of one-party rule under uh, Governor Peter Shumlin and a Democrat-controlled House and Senate, and there were lots of challenges for advancing policies and making progress on issues, um, even with one-party rule. Um, this is a very diverse body. There's no question about it. Lots of independents, um, some moderate Democrats, um, some pretty moderate Republicans, um, and so it will be um, a, a really uh, big challenge for this group to come together to carry out the people's agenda, uh, but that's what Vermonters expect them to do. But I think you kind of nailed it on the head a little while ago. Yeah. In fact, I'll quote a buddy of mine who I was chatting with over the weekend who said, if you look at my ballot, you would think that I was a crazy person because I vote all over. And Vermont really has a history of just picking the, who they think is best to fill that seat. It's about having faith for your people to do the job. Yep. Uh, that's right. And we know that a, a lot of Vermonters know the individuals that they're voting for, even the governor. They've met him. Um, he's been in their communities. And so, you know, that also, I think, contributes to this inclination to ticket split, to vote for the person. But again, the expectation is that these leaders are going to figure out a way to carry out the people's agenda. What is going to be the thing that you're going to watch tonight that you think uh, everybody should really be paying close attention to? Well, I mean, the obvious one uh, are the numbers in the House. So will Democrats have that veto-proof supermajority that we've been talking so much about? Uh, they need 100 seats out of the 150-member mm -hmm. uh, body. Um, uh, it's possible that they'll get there, um, but even if they don't, uh, they will have a coalition of some uh, willing progressives. But again, we know that there's a, a similar coalition of moderate Democrats. Um, so it, it remains to be seen whether or not they'll have the numbers uh, uh, to secure that veto-proof supermajority. Denise, Denise Casey. Casey, thank you. Yeah. Great to talk with you. All right, let's take a look at the numbers for Vermont's lieutenant governor race. Let's see, incumbent David Zuckerman at 56% and his GOP challenger, Don Turner, at 42% with 135 of the 275 precincts reporting. All right, let's uh, check in with Avery Powell. There he is right there. What's going on, Avery? Darren Salin, still a lot of excitement here. And as you just said, David Zuckerman is leading Don Turner. And this race is interesting because both men have served a long time in politics. Zuckerman since 1997 in the Vermont House. So it's kind of getting Vermonters two different ideas of what Vermont should be run like, and also two different Vermonters who have both had a long history in politics. But David Zuckerman, actually, since he is a progressive Democrat, he went over to the Progressive Party's campaign headquarters and then to celebrate there. So he has left here, but we're still going to wait to see what's going to happen later on tonight. Celine, Darren, back to you. So Avery, do, is he comfortable with his lead right now? Did you get a chance to chat with him about that? As far as what we're seeing right now, 57% to 42%. Is he okay with those numbers? He thinks he's going to hold on? Well, I just reached out to the campaign a few moments ago, haven't heard back yet, but when I talked with him earlier in the night, he seemed very comfortable even without knowing any of the numbers, so he seemed pretty confident that this was, he was going to take this race. Avery, thank you. All right, now to Channel 3's Taylor Young covering the Turner campaign. She's live at Republican headquarters in South Burlington. Taylor, what's the mood there right now? 
Well, Celine, it's really mellowed out here right now. People are taking the podium now, thanking their supporters. But one person that hasn't taken the stand yet is um, Turner. He, he hasn't gone up there. But we did speak to him earlier, and he said he, he's nervous about tonight. And he has really been the voice of the Republican Party for the last six years, serving as the minority leader. And this is his first statewide race. And he says if he wins, he really plans to lower the cost of living and lower taxes. And we'll be watching this race closely and speaking with him as soon as we can. Darren Celine. Uh, Taylor, I got to ask you a question about this. We just saw Avery at the uh, Democrats. You're there at the Republicans. The Democrats was so loud that Avery had to put his finger in his ear. It seems like a very different mood there, or is it simply because someone's at the podium? I mean, Jim Condos was at the podium at the Dems as well. I mean, yeah, we just had someone up on the podium. It looks like we're in between right now, and it's really mellowed here. I mean, before you saw behind me people standing up, people clapping, people cheering. Now everyone is really taking a seat and just having conversations um, with, one, with one another rather than kind of standing up and cheering here. Because of the numbers, because, you know, it's a 57 to 42 percent race. Is that why they're kind of now a little subdued? Yeah, I mean, a lot of their candidates are behind right now, so I really think that has something to do with the, the mellowed out mood here tonight. All right, Taylor, thank you very much. All right, let's take a look at the uh, race for governor. Can we get those numbers up for us? There's the lieutenant governor's race. Let's go to Neil Goswami right. to uh, try to make sense of what's happening with, uh, with these two top races. Hey, Neil. Hey, well, look, the governor's got a pretty pretty good spread right now, about 20 points. Uh, you, you know, his, his message has been affordability, and uh, he's he harped on that pretty much for the last three or four months of this campaign against Christine Hulquist, whose message was really about big spending. Uh, you know, she wanted to bring in some new programs, and... Uh, those things cost money. She said it wouldn't cost voters a lot, but uh, she said that uh, those were things that she could deliver without too much of a uh, tax hike. And uh, it appears that people just didn't buy into that tonight. Uh, and the governor's message of affordability is one that's carrying the night. Neil, have you seen the governor other than up in his room? We had some video of him uh, watching the results come in on Channel 3. Thank you, Governor, for watching. Uh, Neil, a a any idea when he's going to show up in the room? Well, we have heard from his campaign manager that uh, Christine Hallquist has not yet conceded the race. They're waiting for that to happen. When it does, he will make his way down to the ballroom here, at which point we do expect it will be a little more cheery in the room uh, when he delivers the victory speech. So that probably will happen shortly. Uh, he is expected to come down soon. So it all depends on when Christine Hallquist may or may not concede this race. Neil Goswami, thank you. And there yep. are the numbers. An incumbent, Bill Scott, up by 57% over his Democratic challenger, Christine Hallquist, at 39%. What a night we've seen so yeah. far. Still much more to be decided. <laughs> we know you want to learn more about what's happening with the races around the country, so we're going to join CBS News now, but we will cut back in with any big developments that arise in our region. See you soon. What's your next steps? Are you done in politics or are you going to go for another run sometime? I have no idea. I didn't get into this with a backup plan. You know, I'll probably be looking for a job tomorrow, but but I don't know what I'm doing next. But cer certainly, you know, certainly that's, you know, I, I got I to gotta think about what's next. And what's your message to supporters after tonight? I am so, I, the supporters have been so awesome. There's been so much commitment so much emotional commitment and so much of, of love it was a labor of love and i'm just this i would not i wouldn't change anything this was beautiful all right christine hallquist thank you so yeah. much for being here tonight for us you're welcome thank you all right throwing it back to you guys in the studio Kathleen Zoni with Christine Hallquist, the Democrat who just conceded the race to Republican Phil Scott in the race for Vermont governor. And we have much more to come. We'll see you back here tonight at 11. See you soon, everybody. You're watching WCAX, live coverage of election night 2018. Welcome.
Welcome back to election 2018. I'm Celine MacArthur. And I'm Darren Perrin. Vermont voters have handed Governor Phil Scott a second term in office. Let's take a look at the numbers. Incumbent Phil Scott beating Democratic challenger Christine Hall quiz 56 to 39 percent. And now he is getting ready to give his victory speech. He is. He is at the podium now. Let's listen in. You know, throughout my life, whether it be in business or racing or politics, I've been able to bring people together who have the right attitude, the right chemistry in order to be successful. So I'd like to thank my, my team right now, both my campaign team who worked the long days that became even longer nights. And if they could just step out here for a minute, I'd like to thank Brittany. Come on up, Brittany. Jason, where's Jason? Tori, how about Hazel? Where's Hazel? And what's really amazing is this is our core. This is the four. They brought it home, you know? The, the average age of these four is about 25. And three out of the four are either going to UVM or graduating from UVM. So we have a lot to be proud of. As well, on the official side, I want to thank my cabinet and the staff who stuck with me through thick and thin. I'm blessed with an incredibly talented team, so loyal and so bright, who have spent the last two years working to make the vision that we share for Vermont a reality. Now, I look and I know uh, we've, uh, we've taken tonight off, we'll do that, but I look forward to continuing our work. So for all of you, we're going back to work tomorrow and we'll start again the next two years. So tonight, 180 Vermonters were elected to serve uh, as our legislature for the next two years. I wanna personally congratulate each and every one of them. Some are here this evening, Maybe you could raise your hands if you're here and we're elected today, tonight. Thank you very much. And I look forward to working with you in the coming months. And work being the key word because there's so much to do. There are few higher honors than being elected by your neighbors for them to have enough faith and trust in you to represent them and their interests and be the person they're counting on to work on the issues that are most important to them and our communities. And there's no greater responsibility than working every day to understand how to solve the problems we face as a state. For those newly elected, like I was 18 years ago, you may still think everything is black or white, yes or no, but I would warn you, there's a lot of gray in between. Typically, there are no easy answers, no corners to cut, only hard work ahead to do all we can do to create a stronger, more vibrant future for all of us. In electing a governor of one party and a legislature by another, the message Vermonters have sent to us tonight is clear. Work together. Vermonters are saying they want us to work for them, not against each other. They are saying we need to listen to one another and prove to the rest of the nation that in Vermont we can and will rise above partisan politics. We must come together for the future of our state in order to strengthen our economy, make Vermont more affordable, and protect the most vulnerable in all 251 communities across the state. Whether you're from Brighton or Brandon, Albany or, or, or Alberg, we all want the same thing. We want the kids in every community to get a great education, learn a trade, pursue the career of their dreams, buy a home, start a family, and retire right here in this state. This is the challenge we face together. And tonight, I humbly accept that challenge once again.
I also want to thank my opponent, Christine Hallquist, for stepping up and running an energized and historic campaign. While we may not have agreed on many issues, we did agree from the start that this race would be about things we felt mattered to most of the people of Vermont. While across the nation, other races in other states turned negative and uncivil, in Vermont, we rose above it. The news out of Vermont this election was clear. We can disagree, we can debate, and we can do it with passion, but in this state, we can do it respectfully. It wasn't perfect, and at times we were reminded that we're not immune to the hate and bigotry that are all, are all too present across the country. But by and large, the campaign was marked by the type of civility Vermonters and Americans, for that matter, deserve in the public process. There was probably no better example of this than Zach Mayo and Lucy Rogers of Cambridge, two candidates ending a debate last month by sitting together to perform a musical duet. For this and for stepping up and putting yourself out there, I'd like to thank all the candidates tonight, win or lose. From the top of the ticket all the way down, it's not easy to put yourself out there. So I thank you for your contribution to the conversation and commitment to making Vermont a better place. Governor Scott celebrating victory, saying while his team is taking the night off, they're going back to work tomorrow because there's a lot to do for Vermont. He's also thanking the voters for having faith in him. He says the fact that Vermonters are voting in leaders from different parties says to him that the voters want both parties to work together and solve some of Vermont's biggest problems. You know, he talked about the mm -hmm. civility in yep. this race between himself and Christine Hallquist, the Democrat who ran against him. Um, he talked about how it was important that that they could disagree, yep. that they could debate and do so with passion, but at the same time, do so with civility. And he gave an example of a couple of folks running for the House <laughs> who ended a debate by playing music together. A duet. Yeah, how, how perfect for yes. describing how Vermont politics go. He talked about in the importance of mm -hmm. continuing this conversation, um, and he thought, thanked he thanked um, Christine Hallquist for starting that conversation that he thinks that uh, people should continue. Let's go to Neil Goswami, our State House reporter. He has been following this race from the beginning. Neil. Hey, yeah, you heard the governor speaking tonight about civility, thanking his opponent, Christine so Hallquist, for running a good, clean race. Um, he's going to be winning this race by a pretty wide margin, uh, but he did thank Christine Hallquist for running hard and for running a clean one. And uh, you heard him reiterating that message that he's been harping on since the 2016 campaign, really talking about affordability here in Vermont, and he's promising to continue that moving forward during a second term. And so, Neil, uh, what are you expecting once the governor hits the ground running? He says he's headed back to work tomorrow. How is he going to work with what looks like more Democrats in the legislature this coming session? Programs which could harm the most vulnerable. Yeah, well, we're, we're really seeing a number of moderate Republican That's House members losing to tonight, which is going to make it extremely difficult for the governor to continue pushing the agenda that he has had in this first term. Now, he has promised to, to come back with a new education plan. His previous efforts in the first two years have not been successful and has met with pretty strong resistance against the Democratic majority. He might face a, a stronger Democratic majority, so it might make the governor move a little bit more toward Democrats in the search for compromise and consensus and avoid we'll some of the, uh, the, the vetoes that he had to issue this year. So Neil Goswami, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. We will be back with comprehensive coverage at the top of the hour, 11 o'clock. Yeah, uh, about uh, 13 <laughs> minutes. We'll see you then. Vermont Federal Credit Union. See where better banking takes you. When you leave Aquasasne Mohawk Casino Resort, the fun doesn't have to end. Download the Play Mohawk Casino app and you'll get free chips to play games like Longhorn Jackpots and Golden Wins. Take your games to go with the Play Mohawk app from the home of the everyday winner.
Rachel Scott wins a second term as Vermont's governor, defeating Christine Holmquist by double digits. Both candidates complimented each other for running civil campaigns. Here is what some of what Scott had to say to his supporters. Well, we may not have agreed on many issues. We did agree from the start that this race would be about things we felt mattered to most of the people of Vermont. While across the nation, other races and other states turn negative and uncivil in Vermont, we rose above it. The news out of Vermont this election was clear. We can disagree, we can debate, and we can do it with passion, but in this state, we can do it respectfully. And we want to take a look at where the candidates gained their support around Vermont. The red counties will indicate where Phil Scott did well, blue counties where Christine Hallquist did well. And as you see right here, really the only county she picked up with a stronghold was down in Wyndham County. The rest of the state has gone red for Phil Scott. This is with 236 out of 271 precincts reporting. Now, typically, Chittenden County is one you can kind of bank on going blue. Not the case in this race. Also, her own home county of Lamoille County, also a red for Phil Scott. Usually also Wyndham County. That's a good one to go blue as well. Not this time around. The entire state pretty much going for Phil Scott. Let's take a look now at how the vote broke down in Chittenden County. Again, a quarter of the votes in the state of Vermont usually come from Chittenden County and Burlington. Really, is it? Along with Huntington, the rest of Chittenden County went for Phil Scott tonight. And let's take a look now at the lieutenant governor's race. The counties in green favored the progressive David Zuckerman. And pretty much across the board here, aside from Rutland County and across the top tier of Vermont, Essex County, Orleans County, Franklin County, and Grand Isle County, all going to David Zuckerman, the red to Don Turner, the Republican who conceded the race. Now let's take a look at the U.S. Senate race, the gold representing independent Bernie Sanders. And pretty much sweeping the state, these, I guess, are still undecided. And in the race for Vermont's lone U.S. House seat, it's Peter Welch winning across the board, as you can see. Well, voters in New York's North Country deciding who to send to Congress tonight. Do they stick with two-term Republican Elise Stefanik, or will this be part of the Democratic blue wave? Let's take a look at the numbers. As we can see here, incumbent Elise Stefanik in the lead with 58%. Not only in the lead, she's actually been declared the winner, and she is at the podium speaking now. Let's listen in. Factures for our farmers, and of course, for the brave men and women in the 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum. We need to thank them for their service. We have done a lot of hard work in this campaign. We've made over 400,000 outreach phone calls. We've knocked on 32,000 doors. We have over 2,000 volunteers. This was a get out the vote effort that has been built over the past four years. This seat in Congress is your seat, and it will always be your seat, and I'm so humbled to earn your support and trust for another term. And I also want to thank my family who is here today, my husband, Matt, who last yeah. time was my... <laughs> and my parents and my brother who are here today. So let's celebrate our big wins. Thank you very much for all of the support. Thanks. A short speech there. Let's check in with Kelly O'Brien at Glens. Up. Oh. All right, we were are going to check in again. That was a surprisingly brief one. She thanked uh, her family, she thanked her friends, and she just wanted to celebrate. Yeah, I mean, I would too. <laughs> it's late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be right back.
Two big ticket items on the ballot in Burlington tonight. Let's see what the city voters had to say. Burlington voters have approved a $70 million bond to upgrade the city's high school and have approved the $30 million bond to upgrade wastewater and stormwater systems. Now, Leona Ferraro is our city hall reporter. A couple of big wins for these two ballot items, huh, Neliana? Yeah, Celine Darren, voters were very clear. They overwhelmingly supported the wastewater and stormwater improvement plan with more than 92% voting yes. The plan will end up costing homeowners $5 per household per year for the next 30 years. Voters were a little more torn on whether to upgrade Burlington High School with about 75% voting yes. That renovation plan will add about $300 each year to the property bill of a home assessed at about a quarter of a million dollars. Mayor Murrow Weinberger says he's happy voters approve both measures, but he understands why some in Burlington are hesitant. People are right to be concerned about costs. We have substantial property tax burdens in, the, in this community, and um, it's, it's a reason we worked very hard. I'm proud that of my seven budgets, six of the seven have not involved a, a property tax increase. Other notable ballot results around the state, Montpelier residents approved all of its ballot questions. That means it will get its more than $9 million parking garage and its $16.75 million sewer treatment facility upgrades. Montpelier has also voted to allow non-citizens to vote on city ballot items, but that will need approval from the House, Senate, and the Governor. And Hartford, Vermont voters uh, decided to advise the select board to rename Christopher Columbus Day to Indigenous people. People's Day. South Burlington voters have approved a new $20 million municipal building. In the newsroom, Neliana Ferraro, Channel 3 News. Neliana, thank you. Well, a big night for Vermont's most popular leader, Senator Sanders and Congressman Welch, keeping their seats. And Governor Scott also goes back to work, as he said, tomorrow yes. to continue into his second term in the state's top job. Democrats appeared to have gained some seats in the state legislature too. So you want to tune in starting at 5 a.m. because we're going to have more reaction and analysis to really show you the impact that all of these decisions are going to have on voters in New York, in Vermont, and in New Hampshire. Absolutely, and check out our website as well, WCAX.com. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Election 2018. Good night. Good night, everybody.